Hello everybody, welcome back to the workshop. So in this video, we are going to discuss what you can do with a beat up anvil. If you happen to find yourself in a position where you have one, hopefully one that's not as beat up as this uh, little Vivor anvil that Thomas and I absolutely destroyed. Um, hopefully it's not in that rough of shape, but today I'm gonna take and show you how you can improve an anvil, even one that is almost completely destroyed like this anvil was. Um, so I hope you guys will enjoy the video. Grab a bag of popcorn and let's get right into it. So let's go over first a few safety things that you're probably going to want to have on hand in order to dress up an anvil. Um, so when dressing up an anvil, you're gonna be doing a ton of grinding. So you're definitely gonna to wanna to cover your ears with some sort of hearing protection. I've got earbuds in that are noise canceling. Um, so those are really great that you know you wanna take and have some uh, ear protection on. Obviously you wanna protect your eyes. A respirator can be a really great thing as well. Um, beyond that, you're gonna want a nice stiff pair of leather. Um, you know, a leather grinding apron of some kind. This really does help out a ton with you not catching fire from the grinding sparks. Uh, you're gonna want a good stiff pair, good heavy set pair of uh, welding gloves as well, a, a nice pair of wet leather welding gloves. Now I know there's some controversy about wear, wearing gloves with spinning tools and equipment, but in this case, this throws off a ton of heat and sparks and bits of metal uh, when you're grinding away. And it, it's just better to take and have a pair of gloves, especially if you're not trying to grab the spinning wheel. So keep your hands away from the spinny end and you'll be just fine and uh, protect your hands from the really heavy, heavy heated sparks that'll come off something like this. So that's my suggestion. Uh, gloves, again, I wear them. You don't have to. I recommend them, but you don't have to. Use your own smarts and however you feel comfortable uh, with that. So beyond that, you're gonna need some cutting discs. You're gonna need, be needing a stone, um, grinding stones for an angle grinder because all this work's gonna be done with an angle grinder, a four and a half inch angle grinder, by the way. So you're gonna to wanna to take it and go ahead and have some grinding stones and you're gonna to wanna to have some cutting discs and then you'll also want to have some flap discs and various grits. And finally, if you want to get a nice polish on it, I suggest a nice sanding pad backer, like a, a Velcro backer pad on a sander, so you can get a one final nice smooth, like 320 grit finish. Now that's quite high for most forging work, um, but if you want to take it up that extra little notch, you can do that, but that last part's optional. So the first thing you have to do with your anvil, you need to assess what damage is there. Um, do you have really nasty hammer blows in the face? If you do, you need to assess how deep those really are and whether they're worth grinding out completely because it's entirely possible, especially on an older anvil, that you can grind through what's left of the surface plate that was forge welded on the anvil. So on antique anvils, I would kind of stay away from grinding anything too deep. It's okay to kind of buff the surface up and get a little smoother finish, but you do not want to take a do heavy grinding removal. Now in this particular case, this is a cast steel anvil. And so therefore I needed to remove a lot of material and the cast steel is fine. I can remove a bunch of material and still be okay, still be within my hardened area. Um, and so it should still be relatively hard and a good, good surface after I'm done. Price Centered Ironworks is sponsored by blacksmithsupply.com and viewers like you. Be sure to check out blacksmithsupply.com for all your forging needs. Now back to the video. So after you've assessed what damage is there, um, in this particular case, the tail section broke off, but along that, there was also a section where it was almost a chipped out edge, where the edge almost chipped out. So I wanted to remove all of that out to, pre to prevent 
potential future risk of that chip coming out. Um, so I ended up cutting and bobtailing this anvil quite short in order to get past any of that damaged area on the tail. So if you come up with one with a broken tail and the tail's nowhere to be found, but it's all jagged on the back, you might want to consider go ahead and bobbing that up and it'll make a little cleaner and nicer anvil to work off of, certainly visually wise. So in this case, all I did is I drew a, uh, basically a straight line across it, put a speed square on it, got a nice line going up both sides vertical and make sure everything's true and plumb with my line. And then I started in on it with the cutting disc. Now with the cutting disc, my aim was to basically notch this or nick it all the way around and create a concentrated point of stress. And so what I did is I cut in and probably three quarters of an inch on the sides. And then across the top, I went to just a little over halfway through the actual tail section of of the anvil. Now this is a real handy thing you can do with higher carbon steels is you can actually get a stress riser formed by creating a stressing point by nicking them and then you could take a hammer on it and it'll crack through wherever that's at. Just like stress risers and anything else, if with that concentrated stress point, when you whack on it, it has a tendency to split and crack right in line with wherever you might have had little spider cracks or fissures. So we were just using that to our advantage instead of me having to completely saw completely through and clean all this up. It was just a lot easier to do it that way, nick it and whack it off with a nice 16 pound sledge. So that way I got rid of that excess tail section and all the bad area that we had there. From there, I had to clean up. Obviously that wasn't a clean cut all the way through. There were some, you know, uh, there were some, basically some chip out and stuff from knocking that tail off. And so I went ahead and ground that up and got that a lot cleaner. So again, that is specific to this. Now let's say you don't have that to do. Um, then don't worry about it. Then this, this portion is completely superfluous. You don't have to listen to this portion of the video. But after we got that cleaned up, I decided to go and take on and tackle all the hammer blows that Thomas and I put into the face of this anvil. And some of those were pretty darn deep, a good 16th of an inch down into the surface. So I needed to remove and hog off a good bit of material. And so that's what the stone wheel is for on your angle grinder. We've all seen them, the four and a half inch stone wheels. Um, that is what those are for. Those are perfect for shaping and carving. Think of them almost like a carving instrument than they are a grinder, right? You're not trying to get anything flat and smooth with those. You're trying to shape the piece. You're trying to shave off material as you go. And so you wanna keep that wheel cutting with the least area surface of contact on the anvil face as you take off layer by layer in a progressive fashion on this. Now you'll see in the video here, I am also running from front to back, then I'm running left to right, then diagonally one way, diagonally the other way, and then back front to back. What I'm trying to do there is I'm trying to eliminate a lot of the scalloping you would get if you just kept staying in one direction with the angle grinder. The angle grinder is a curved surface and we're wanting a perfectly flat surface. So uh, a curved surface is not great at producing a flat honed surface. So the way that we get that flat honed surface in there is by, by hand at least, is by changing the direction of our grinding pattern as we take off layer by layer and work out uh, you know, work out those hammer marks. One of the other things that doing this crisscrossy kind of pattern will do is it will help highlight where you still need to grind because you get grinding and it looks really good in one direction and then you change direction and you realize there's still a dip or there's still a little hammer mark in there, or there might be a high spot that you didn't notice just going all from the one direction. So it's really good to do that crisscrossy kind of mix match pattern. So after getting that done, I tackle on shaping the horn. Now we put a lot of damage into the horn as far as uh, hammer marks into this horn, but this is an unhardened horn. So that's 
I mean, that's really nice. It was really easy to dress this up. And again, you can start seeing how the shaping of this works with the angle grinder with the stone wheel on there. You use it as almost like a carving knife and you're just power carving off little layers, little runs at a time and just stacking those up and trying to carve and reshape uh, the horn to what you need. Um, it took no time at all, you know, probably five minutes to clean that horn, grind it down to where I'd like it to be. So after we got that accomplished, um, if you notice, I did not mess with the edges yet. I haven't messed with the anvil edges. That'll be coming up soon when we move to the flap disc. The stone wheel is a little too aggressive on the carving standpoint to dress your edges with a stone wheel. You really only want to dress your edges of your anvil with a flap disc. So that's what we moved on to next. The flap disc I'm using in this video is just a 60 grit flap disc. And so I use that to take and go ahead and shape up the profile of my edges and also to go in that crisscross pattern again on the anvil itself, on both the face and then on the horn. I started working that down, all the roughness that I created by carving it with the stone wheel of the angle grinder. I went ahead, went to the flap disc and started flap disking this down to get a much smoother finish and a much more even finish. A flap disc is really great for that because it has some give unlike a stone wheel. And so it has a tendency to contour a little bit better to surfaces and it leaves a much nicer, nicer finish than the stone wheel for sure. Also, while I was at it, I went ahead and cleaned up the step with that flap disc. We didn't actually hit the step with any hammer blows, but it was kind of rough from the factory. So I just went ahead and cleared up the step too while I was at it. So moving on from that, here's the optional step. Um, after, you, after you have done all of that, now it is, so now it is your choice how you want to take an, you know, well, this isn't the optional step, this is the next step. Now it's your choice to how you want to take and dress your anvil edges up. In this particular anvil, I chose to dress it like a traditional dressed anvil, where we have a heavier radius on the one side and a sharper radius towards the tail section. So I went ahead and followed that theme all the way through and redressed it like I had previously before we did our destruction test on this anvil. And I just went back with that. Uh, that didn't take real long. There was a few little hammer marks in the edge. Um, that I just needed to dress out. So it has a little bit more of a role to it than uh, what I personally would like. But again, we beat it up. So we are just working with what we had. So I went ahead and dressed those out nicely and then took the time also to dress the back of this heel. I didn't want that to be super, super sharp. I wanted to dress it to the same radii that the other back sides of the heel uh, was dressed to. And I did all of that with the flap disc. And now that right there, you can leave it right there. Leave it right there. This am that anvil would be perfectly serviceable, wonderful actually to work on with a 60 grit finish. I decided to take it to that extra little bit of a level by throwing on a 300 grit sanding disc on a flat backer pad and really leveling out and going across the face of this anvil and getting it kind of polished up with that 320 grit. And I also did the horn as well, just to shine it up there and make it look like a new penny. And again, that step is really optional. You have to dress the anvil to your own taste. Sometimes if you get these anvils too polished up, your steel has a tendency to kick around and really slip on you a lot. So having a little bit of surface texture in your anvil is not a bad thing. Sometimes it helps the steel kind of stay put and uh, grip. If you don't believe me, try polishing up a piece of like a hammer face on one side and use it as an anvil just, just as a test and try to whack around on a piece of steel and then leave the other side rusty and forge on it. And you'll see what I'm talking about, about that stick. But yeah, so uh, don't go too crazy. I would never recommend anything over 320 and I'm definitely not going to take and polish this to a mere finish or anything like that. It's just not necessary for a blacksmith's work. So that's really about it. Um, you, you know, I think this will work out all right. Uh, people will ask me, I'm sure, well, what are you going to do with this anvil now? Well, if I don't give it away on the channel for one of the giveaways as, as a 
give it as a just a giveaway item uh, during one of our monthly live streams. Most likely, I will just give it to some new starting out Smith that's somewhere here, um, you know, local to me. Uh, the, the reason for that being, I can't sell something like this and I would never sell something like this. Because I've done torture testing to this, there is always that possibility that there is some unforeseen cracks or, or DLAMs or who knows what else in this because I have stress tested it beyond uh, its limits. And so therefore, it is great for a beginner to kind of test, you know, practice around on, play with, and tinker with, but it's not something I would ever sell to anybody. Um, it's, it's really just, you, you know, it's not worth it. You can go out and pick these up over on Amazon, uh, you know, or on Vivor's website for, you know, a hundred bucks, hundred and a half tops. It's a cheap enough anvil. You should just buy a brand new one. But yeah, so I'm just going to go ahead and give this away to somebody at some point in time. Um, you know, and it'll be a great little starter beginner anvil for someone. And, uh, you know, I think, I think it'll work really well. I'm glad it wasn't just completely destroyed during our destruction test because it allows me to, you know, further it along to somebody else and uh, it can help get somebody started, which is, which is pretty cool. And I do that with all of my destruction tested animals, anvils, if they survive enough that they are serviceable steel. Uh, that I feel comfortable to give them away. So that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed this video of how I dress this up in this little video se series on this anvil. Um, be sure to check out all the other videos in the playlist around the Vivor 66 pound uh, London pattern anvil. And uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day. God bless you all and we'll catch you on the next one.